attendees are in listen-only mode. Greetings and welcome to today's DCMI ACES joint webinar. My name is Stuart Sutton and I serve as Managing Director of the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce today's webinar and our presenter. I'll also moderate the uh, question and answers at the close of the webinar. The webinar is scheduled for an hour to an hour and 15 minutes with the final 20, 15 to 24 questions and answers from our presenter. Today's webinar is the second in a series with Richard Wallace on the topic of schema.org extensions. The first webinar looked at the fundamentals of schema.org, its utility for bibliographic description, and the schema.org community extension mechanism. And today's webinar uh, takes a deeper dive into the technical processes of extension. Now Richard is the chair of two W3C community groups that are working in this space. Uh, the schema.org uh, bib extend community and the schema archetypes community. Um, he's an ardent advocate for the adoption of linked data and cultural heritage in the wider web. He currently work, is working with OCLC, Google, and the banking industry on the extension application and use of schema.org vocabularies. So welcome Richard and I turn the podium over to you. Uh, thank you. My, that podium's heavy. Um, thank you, Stuart. Um, welcome, as Stuart said, to uh, part two of, uh, of this series. What I intend to do is have a very brief uh, recap on what we went through on the first one, where schema.org came from, etc. But then, as Stuart said, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into uh, how you work with schema.org, how you might apply it, what tools you can use to check uh, that you've applied it correctly and then I'll also do some work with the schema.org source itself and, and how you can play with it and uh, share it with your friends and, and other interested parties etc. So just a, a brief overview so people can visualize this uh, slightly strange British accent. Um, this is me um, uh, and I'm an independent consultant evangelist and founder of, uh, of Data Liberate which is uh, has its, its mission to liberate the value in data, uh, be it through linked data or any other technology that pragmatically delivers value based on that data. Also, as Stuart says, I, I'm the chair of uh, the Schema Bib Extend W3C community group, which is looking at bibliographic data extensions to schema.org and resulted in the bib.schema.org extension, which I'll talk about later. I also edit bibliograph.net, which is uh, uh, an activity that extended schema.org externally from, from its main namespace. Uh, also schema archetypes. This is a fairly new community group looking at extending things for archives and may end up with an archives.schema.org or may not depending on pragmatically how things are delivered. Uh, and as Stuart also said, I'm working with Google on the schema.org site and within the community about enabling extensions, uh, managing updates to the, the vocabulary in that environment and generally uh, getting involved in that environment. OCLC, my former employees, I was t uh, technology evangelist at OCLC, uh, Global Library Cooperative, Cooperative, very active in, um, in schema.org and, and, and very early to apply schema.org to their worldcat.org site with currently something like 330 odd million uh, bibliographic resources described using schema.org. Uh, and finally I'm working with the financial industry where they're looking to apply schema.org and possibly an extension uh, to add value to the description of financial products online, bank accounts, credit cards, insurance policies, that kind of stuff. Right, so enough about me and what's going on around. Schema.org. Um, um, as I said last week, Schema.org appeared on the scene in June 2011 based on this blog post from uh, Google, Bing and Yahoo. Very rapidly they were joined by Yandex, the Russian search engine, and it, it introduced a vocabulary with some hundred types to describe things, types and classes are very synonymous with each other. But looking at various areas, creative works, uh, um, 
uh, embedded objects like audio and, and video objects, events, organizations, persons, places, product related stuff, uh, review and, and that kind of thing. All the kind of thing that we're interested in on the web, how can we uh, apply it in a more structured way. Their main target was rich snippets, the ability to add extra structured data, well structured as it's supplied by the publisher of their data, added structured data to uh, results in the search indexes of, of the search engines, not necessarily affecting their results position, but adding value. So in this example here, you can see there's star ratings, there's reviews, there's, a, there's an image of this Thai green mango salad. Uh, so, so it's providing more information to the user other than just um, a, um, a, a, a reference to click. Uh, so schema.org, is uh, a linked data vocabulary. It's um, based around RDF triples. It uses URIs or URLs, also strings values, and it consists of types or classes, properties, and enumerations of fixed values. Now, anybody from the linked data world would recognize that. You've, you find it difficult in schema.org promotional material and indeed in documentation to find uh, it being uh, trumpeted from the rooftops that it's a linked data vocabulary because most of the people applying it don't need to know. They just need to know the way to apply this data um, to, to their information on the web. Um, and, and to be fair, many people are, are very mistrusting of the phrase semantic web and linked data, uh, believe it's something to do with the artificial intelligence community only. and um, it helped with the adoption of schema.org that that wasn't too uh, strongly shouted about. And because it's targeted at the general web, it hasn't got some of the constraints that you would expect to find in uh, um, ontologies that you would find around uh, linked data generally. So it's not strongly typed. There's not major insistence on, on relationships within the vocabulary. So for instance, uh, there isn't a range and a domain value that is defining the vocabulary. Its range includes and domain includes. So it's more advisory than, uh, than rule-based or um, some people from the linked data world would refer to OWL ontology controlling it. It's available in three serializations, microdata, RDFA, and JSON-LD, which means that the, those applying schema.org to their websites don't have to cross religious boundaries between their favorite way of describing things within a web page, uh, it's available uh, in those three formats. So to, in summary, it's a web vocabulary to describe stuff. With over 100 types when it first appeared, it was capable uh, of, of, of describing most things in the web to some extent or another. So. Um, why is schema.org so important? Well, coincidentally, about a year later, we started to hear of something called the Knowledge Graph. The Knowledge Graph was launched uh, in May 2012 by uh, this blog post from, from Google. Um, and, and it's about the knowledge panels that we started to see fairly soon afterwards uh, that appeared, adding informational, context-based information about the entities that were being referenced with search results. So from um, um, information about people and, uh, and, and important people in society to uh, entertainment, etc. Now, the knowledge graph itself uh, since moved on to power things other than um, the knowledge panel. Um, it's, it's now powering the info box, which uh, the search engines often provide you information ahead of the search results. Um, it powers uh, answer boxes where they've got direct answers that they can uh, they can give you from the data that's held in the knowledge graph, uh, and it still also adds value around rich snippets. This data has come from many sources on a particular Google level. They they use Freebase, which is uh, almost a linked data Wikipedia type uh, data set that was. Uh, um, uh, obtained by Google when they took on a, a company called MetaWeb. They use that to seed their knowledge graph. They bring in data from search results. They bring in data from harvesting factual sites like Wikipedia and the more structured version Wikidata. 
But increasingly, as schema.org spreads across the web, much of the structured information that's populating the knowledge graphs and the relationships within it comes from schema.org, which is why schema.org is important. Schema.org has already spread to over 10 million domain, domains across the web. It's got a broad vocabulary. Version 2.2 was released about a month ago, and, and it has increased the, uh, the number of types and properties, etc. Beyond that, over 100 to 642 types, 992 properties, and 219 uh, um, values that are held in, in, in enumerations in the uh, vocabulary. Uh, extensions have already been published in August of this year. The auto.schema.org uh, extension appeared to, um, to help describe motor vehicles, etc. And the one I'm closely associated with, bib.schema.org, appeared to increase its capability um, in the um, bibliographic area. So um, schema.org has become uh, a de facto vocabulary for structured data on the web. If you want to send structured data to um, the wider world, especially the, the search engines built in their knowledge graph, uh, it's the vocabulary to use. Um, so scheme it all, what does it look like? Well, this is where I start getting brave and start doing things live on the system. So let me have a look in a web browser here. So this is the schema.org site. This is the home page that you end up at when, uh, when you go to that address. Um, let's have a, have a quick look around it. If we go to the schemas page, we can see that the organization of the schemas is described. And here are those numbers that I quoted earlier. These are actually calculated live on the site. Um, so if the numbers are wrong, blame me, because I wrote that bit of code, but that's beside the point. So let's, let's have a look around the vocabulary. Let's go and have a look at one page per type. And this starts us off as, at a type called thing. The most generic type of item um, is, is a thing. It's got various properties. Um, it's got, uh, let's see, it's got um, a name um, here. It's, so we've got name, we've got uh, alternate name that we can look at, we've got description, we've got image, uh, we've got same as so that you can relate this thing to another thing, uh, which is the same. You've got a, a URL for the identification of off, uh, item. And there are a couple of other things here that, um, that come in handy when you're describing a thing within a in the website. So main entity of page, if you're trying to identify a thing as being the most important thing on a web page, that comes in handy. And potential action, there's a whole area around actions within schema.org, which I'm not going to go into, into today, but it, it's about what potential action you could make on this thing, like you could read it, or you could purchase it, or, or you could... Um, show it to you, etc. So thing is the most, most basic type, and you can see here that even the plain thing type is already in use on between uh, 100,000 and a quarter of a million domains on the web. So uh, let's, let's dig a little bit deeper and, and look at some of the more specific types or subtypes. Um, let, let's go and have a look at creative work. Creative work is the generic kind of creative work so uh, as it says at the top here, includes books, movies, photographs, software programs, anything effectively that's being created by um, a person in effect. Uh, as you can see here, between a quarter and a half a million domains are using creative work rule. So we've got various attributes that are, that are now added in, now that we're talking about a creative work type of thing. We've got about, which is the generic subject relationship, so it can be about uh, a place, a person, another thing. Um, it can be about, um, from the bibliographic world, a subject or a topic, etc. There's a whole set of attributes here that are to do with um, accessibility. So is it the type of creative work I, 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 uh, I, I need a screen reader for or I can use a screen reader for? We've got um, some obvious things like author, uh, citation, comments, um, copyright information, file formats, genres, etc. We've got a massive selection of, uh, of, of properties which are added on top of 
the properties that we inherit from thing. And, and if we, we look down the page, uh, we can see uh, that the site tells us which properties within the rest of the vocabulary are expecting a creative work uh, uh, as a value. And we look at more specific types, so we can see we can go into article and blog and book and music competition, composition and questions, recipes, sculptures, etc. And down at the bottom of the page, uh, which is the standard practice for the schema.org site, we have some examples. So I'll pick this short one out because it will um, it will fit on the screen. Uh, and that is um, the standard way of describing examples within schema.org are aimed at the person who's creating a web page and wants to embed this data in it. There's nothing to stop you using schema.org formatted data elsewhere in a triple store or, or for any other purpose, but its main target audience is, is the, uh, the webmaster. So if we take a look at this, you see by default without markup. So this is what you would see uh, on a web page before you even bothered putting schema.org data in. So what we're looking at here is, uh, by the look of it again, from, uh, by Sony on the PlayStation 3 platform, uh, with a link to an image. So this is without markup, but within HTML. If we go and have a look at that in microdata, we can start to see uh, things like item scope and item type here. So what it's saying is the thing that we're describing within this div element of the HTML is a schema.org creative work. Uh, it, it's got uh, an image which source is videogame.jpg here. It's got a property name of Re Resistance 3. Uh, it's got an author property of Sony. Uh, and it's got uh, a content rating of Mature on it. So this is the way you would describe that data in RDF, in uh, microdata. Let's go and have a look at the same data in RDFA. I'll click back in case you didn't notice the change. Um, the, there are proponents of microdata and RDFA who believe each other's format is almost unintelligible. As I click between the two, you can see there's very, very little difference between the two. But they're, they're, it's important to keep the people providing these, uh, these pages happy with what they can deliver. They, uh, from a, a data point of view, the, the one you can look at is JSON-LD. So this is the same data in JSON which kind of strips away all the HTML stuff so you can actually see what the, uh, the, uh, the data is describing. So we've got a context value here saying that we're in the scheme.org vocabulary. We're saying it's a type of creative work in that vocabulary, author, Sony, content writing, monsieur, and so on. So that, that is um, the way things are, are, uh, are laid out on a standard um, schema.org um, uh, reference page. If we go and follow a more specific type to book, you can see here book has now added some extra properties, book edition, book format, illustrator, ISBN, etc. on top of the properties of creative work. So if we're describing a book, we've got all the properties of thing, creative work, and now book added together. So um, let, let's follow the, th the thing through for a, a pa um, to follow the pattern. So an illustrator uh, in a book is expecting uh, a type of person. If we go and click through, we can see that a person has got exactly the same sorts of, of formats. Uh, uh, they've got e email addresses, family names, fax numbers, uh, and, and all the kind of stuff you would expect a person to use. And, and notice up the top here that we've got over a million domains describing persons. How many over a million? I don't know. Probably a heck of a lot over a million. But let's go back into the schemas and let me pick out uh, a particular type. Uh, down here, we've got something called local business. Local business is what you might call a compound type within schema.org. It's a type that has more than one super type. So we can see at the top here that local business is a subtype of organization, and local business is also a subtype of, type, uh, of, of place, which means the properties that are available to, to us are the combination of both. So we've got some uh, local business specific properties, then we've got the properties from place, uh, and then we've got the properties of organization, and bringing up the real, we've got the properties of thing. So you've got all that capability to uh, 
uh, uh, allow you to describe a particular type of thing. So let me go back to um, um, uh, book for a moment, and let us let's let me show you how that affects in in um, how you mark your data up as well. So let me come down to a um, where are we? A particular example here, this one. Let me look at the JSON-LD of here. So what we're looking at is uh, a book which uh, is not only a book, but it has an additional type of product. So this particular thing that I'm describing here, I'm actually using two schema.org types in comp combination to describe this. So we've got name, We've got author, which is obviously coming from book, as it's a subtype of creative work. We've got something here called offers, which is actually coming in from product. Uh, and um, this comes from effectively in the commercial world, where somebody says, I, I am offering this product to you uh, in, in some way or other. So we say, this offer has a um, schema type of, of offer as, as its property here. And in here you can see uh, availability, it's in stock, serial number, stock control unit, and then a link to an, another type here to say it's offered by, and we're describing an organization here. Uh, uh, library is a subtype of local business, which has got an ID of uh, a made up URL here and the name Anytown Library. And, and some um, more attributes of offer here, we've got business function, which is uh, using a standard value of lease out. Now, I know some librarians around us would, would wonder about the term of lease out, but lending and leasing out are very similar operations, and this would be the, uh, the uh, standard way of doing these things in schema.org. So we've got quite a complex example here, but the, on, on, on marking up within your web page is, is comparatively simple. So uh, we, we've got a thing that's both a book and a product, uh, it has offers against it, and the offer is telling us where we can get it from, which organisations offering it, and, and under what terms. And, and the, the, there's the ability to define price in here, which would be zero, etc. So let, let's go back up uh, and um, look at um, the schemas again. Um, down the bottom of this particular page here, We've, we've got a reference to extensions to the core, vo core vocabulary, and it's referencing the two extensions that are live at the moment. So we've got auto.schema.org. When I click on it and it goes there, yes. So what we can see in, in the autoschema.org is that there are three new types uh, added to the core vocabulary using the uh, auto extension and there's 20 properties so you've got things like seating capacity and wheelbase and things in that environment. In the same way if I go into the bibliographic extension bib.schema.org you can see that it's added uh, 11 types things like atlas, audiobook, chapter, uh, there's some stuff that's come in from the comic community who uh, cooperated uh, inside Schema Bib Extend to have a combined uh, offering, newspaper and thesis, uh, several additional um, properties, uh, abridged, um, Inca and letterer are the important attributes of comics, etc. And what you're seeing here uh, is, is colour coded, and I'm sorry if, if this hasn't, hasn't appeared yet in, in a better way of highlighting things. But the things that are in blue have come in through the extension. The things that are in, uh, in red are properties that have been enhanced within the extension. So the translator property has probably had its uh, domain and range altered, even though translator is part of the core vocabulary. In the same way, duration. Duration, in fact, has had its um, domain enhanced so that duration is now one of the properties that are introduced on the audiobook extension of, uh, of the vocabulary. And there's a new property there, uh, read by. You can also see that uh, audiobook is itself a, uh, a combination type with two parents, which are book and audio objects, which kind of makes sense. An audiobook being a book in audio form with a couple of extra properties. So, 
Um, we've been wandering around the schemas um, uh, one, one type at a time, if you like. Uh, you have the ability to look at the whole hierarchy of, uh, of types within schema.org. Says he taking a drink while this uh, this loads for the first time. Um, perhaps I didn't. I didn't click it. That's why it hadn't loaded. So it will now now come up. I, t I told you it'd be the odd thing that would go wrong because this is live. Come on. Uh, my network needs to rush. Please rush and come on screen, won't you? Anyway, there we go. So what we're looking at here is the full schema uh, .org hierarchy. There's two, in fact. There's property values uh, and, and things that they describe. So we start off with thing at the top. And if we scroll down, and I'm not going to go all the way, but as you can see, there are a lot of them. Um, and um, below thing, we've got the action tree. Um, and the next thing is we've got the creative work tree with article and, and blog and book, etc. You have the option within uh, the interface to be able to look at absolutely everything, which is the core plus uh, all vocabularies, or just an in, uh, all extension vocabularies, or in this case, just to see how the bib extension layers itself across the, the hierarchy that's already there. And unsurprisingly, the bib extension uh, adds um, things to the creative work subtree uh, of the vocabulary. So you can see how uh, comic cover art is a subtype of cover art, which is a subtype of, uh, of visual artwork, and so on. So uh, also at the bottom of this screen, which is one of the reasons I did the shorter version as well, is the t data type uh, hierarchy um, that um, um, underpins the, the whole vocabulary. So you, you've got your standard data types with booleans and dates and date times, numbers, texts and times, etc. Um, so um, let, let's go back uh, to audiobook because um, the concept of extensions um, can be a little bit confusing when you first approach it. So we're looking at audiobook, which is defined in bib.schema.org, uh, an extension to the core vocabulary. But as you can see on the screen here, if I can highlight it, there we go. It's canonical URL, URL the identifier for the type audiobook is actually schema.org audiobook. It's not bib.schema.org slash audiobook. The reason for, for this is extensions were brought in so that they could have focus from particular communities. So the schema pib extend W3C group I chair had focused in on bib.schema.org so they can look at the domain specific attributes of the vocabulary separate from the whole of the community who might be interested in medicine or advertising or sport or something having to understand the semantic discussions but it has to sit within the rest of the vocabulary so by using a flat namespace with everything sat under schema.org uh, it means there can be no conflict between different extensions trying to de define terms of the same name for instance, and also for those applying the vocabulary, they don't have to worry about which um, extension we're in. So um, let me well, let me just whiz back to uh, uh, my presentation to understand where we are. Here we go. Uh, so we're now going to move into another phase here. We've had a look at uh, the vocabulary. We've had a look at the the site and what's uh, what's available in it. Now people have to want to wonder about applying schema.org. So let's go back to my web browser and let's take uh, a website. Uh, this website is, uh, belongs to a company called Smart Trees who do Christmas grotto experiences for children in the middle of England, actually not very far from um, where I'm sat at the moment and I know this site well because I'm married to the person that runs the company but it's 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 a it's a really good grotto experience but that's not the point of me putting it up on um, up on uh, the site here um, I've applied schema.org um, terms to this site and because it's a fairly simple site it, it made a really good example um, we, we want to share structured data with the search engines about um, um, the business uh, that the site's describing. So if, if I look at the page source 
on here and I scroll down, mind your eyes while I get near the bottom, here we go. Here on, on the screen is the, um, the schema.org in RDFA form that describes this site. Uh, so what we're doing is we're saying here that it is using the schema.org vocabulary. We're saying that, that this, this page we're looking at is describing a local business which has got this URL, uh, which has got um, this name, uh, it's got logo images, it's got descriptions, email addresses, phone numbers, same as relationships uh, here looking at uh, other representations of the same organisation. It's actually a sub company so it's got parent organisation, address etc. Uh, and here very useful things, uh, opening our specifications so you can you specify when um, the Christmas grotto is open and people want to come and see Santa Claus. These are the times that they, that they can see. Uh, you could use exactly the same technique to describe when a shop or a library is, is open, etc. So going back to the site itself, obviously that's not visible to the end user and when you're working with sites like this, just looking at the data embedded within it um, uh, is kind of showing you what you've authored. It doesn't, it doesn't kind of tell you whether you've done it well or right or not. So there are various tools around um, that enable you to identify these kind of things and one of them is, is a, uh, an extension to the Chrome web browser I'm using uh, called Green Turtle and if you see the little uh, Green Turtle sign on the screen, if I clock on it, uh, click on it, it uh, hang on, sometimes it does this, I will stop it and, and do it again. Um, this, this is a, uh, an extension that uh, is still in development, here we go, oh that's a bit big, let's, let's make it a bit smaller so we can see it, so, oh, that might be a bit too small, let's come up a bit. So what we're seeing here, this is the data that has been extracted from the RDFA by the Green Turtle tool so that I can identify what has actually been picked out. It's all very well to uh, to look at the markup in page, but this kind of validates that uh, what I'm expecting to be picked up by uh, uh, something harvesting the page is picking it up. It has the uh, the nice benefit of delivering you a, a, a graphical image of um, of what's on site. Uh, and if I click on that and then close the, the little visual window, so the clicking on the right one, go on, close, there we go, it's showing you all the terms that are associated with that node on the graph, etc. And uh, true to its name, if you want to have a look at it in turtle format, which is the format uh, uh, many developers like to look at, here we can see is the data in turtle format. So I've, I've got some um, uh, validation that I'm doing the right sort of thing in this environment. But what if um, I wanted to see what the search engines are making of it? So if I go to uh, something that Google provides, which is the, uh, the developer's um, structured data uh, testing tool, if I just, uh, hang on, I need to yeah, just grab this URL because I'll need it. If I go into structured data testing tool and tell it to fetch the URL that I'm interested in, it will fetch that URL and in real time it will display the contents uh, of, of that URL, so the, the text of the page. But uh, more importantly, I'll scroll up a bit and increase the size a bit so people can see. There we go. Uh, we can see here, here is the information uh, that they've picked up. So this is what Google will grab from your page to put into their systems, into their knowledge vault and, and other uh, areas of the system. Google are not the only people that are doing this kind of thing. So if I go, um, uh, where are we? Yandex, the Russian search engine, has, has a very similar tool here. So if I ask them to check uh, my results, they, they parse it and provide it in a different format. Now it's interesting they're throwing up an error here which we haven't seen before. That is to do with the way 
I've described some relationships on the page. So I've, I've provided an in-page relative link to the place and postal address within the page. But the actual data uh, is, is fine. And as you move from uh, test tool to test tool, you will find variations in the way they interpret things. The Google test tool will sometimes say there's missing properties uh, that it requires. And that's often to do with um, rich snippets. So if you want your data to appear in a rich snippet, it will be looking for um, um, particular attributes. Um, there are non-search engine test tools. So if I go to something called RDF Play, we have here a, um, a, a, a testing tool which has a a useful attribute. So what I'm going to do is um, grab the source you know, and then make it one more size smaller so I can pick it all up. So if I grab this HTML here, whoops, uh, like so, copy that and drop that into the RDFA tool and paste it in there, we end up with uh, Hang on, I've, I've just got, why, why is that doing that? <laughs> Typical live uh, situation, but normally there is a, uh, a visualization uh, that appears on the page. What I what I'll need to do is, I obviously didn't capture the correct uh, amount of data. Perhaps it's because I need that, yes, I probably need that vocab line as well. So if I capture that, and go back in here and repaste it in. That's what I was looking for. Uh, so what you're seeing is not only the data that's been captured, so we can take a look at the raw data uh, in turtle format, but it provides you with a visualization of the relationship between the entities that have been described and, uh, and, and those properties. So you can see very clearly the uh, Five, uh, the four different opening air specifications uh, for the different days of the week, etc., that are available on that site. So um, the final one I'm going to show you uh, is something called the structured data linter. Don't worry about the URLs for these pages; they uh, they will be available um, in the slides. In fact, they'll be up on the slide later on. So let me. Um, just go and get the URL for this site again. I'll probably be quicker if I typed it in, but never mind. Uh, I kind of trust copy and paste. So let's drop that in there, submit it. And this site um, carries out a, um, a couple of extra bits and it tries to imagine what a rich snippet for this particular page that we're looking at would provide. It's got a, a a different way of presenting the data, uh, a more tabular form of presenting the data, and it has a go at trying to create a rich snippet. And you can see it's picked up uh, a couple of images there. Obviously, a search engine would only use one of them, uh, but it, it gives you a view of uh, what the um, the um, uh, search engines are going to make of your data. So. Uh, as I said before, uh, within the, the slides, I've got some links to um, various things. And that link has just reminded me that I missed a particular place to go to. So I need to go to some bookmarks. Here we go. Um, and we'll come back to the links in a moment. What I wanted to say was I've dropped that um, data in there. Uh, I've created RDFA in the page. How did I learn how to do it? There are various resources on the web. But I can highlight, uh, highly recommend this one by a person called Dan Scott. Dan Scott, very active in the Scheme of Vivex, Vivex STEM community group, uh, also associated with the comics group. Uh, and he's done some open source uh, code labs teaching you how to uh, write in um, schema.org. Um, and he has got this example, which, as I say, is, is Creative Commons license, so you can use it. But, and he's using the example of a book. So what he's doing here, he's got the example HTML within a book page. Uh, and then it's, he steps through in very simple steps of how to add things to your markup and then check them. So 
he's saying here to the body tag in the uh, in a particular page. He's he, he added the where did that go? <laughs> where did that go? He's added the the vocabulary tag. Um, let's scroll down a little bit further, and you can see here he's uh, talking about saying it's a type of book, and he's added a property typical age range within the data. And this this is a, an excellent set of uh, code labs. Yes, it's library focused, but most people would understand how to mark up a book uh, and how to describe what a library holds and information about library branch information. There's even a section here about describing peri periodicals. It's a nice step-by-step -step, uh, way of, of uh, trying in your own environment to uh, create schema.org and use the tools I described earlier on to check them. And he, he, he even has a, a zip download of the code lab so you can run it locally and then copy and paste your code into something like the structured data linter or something like that to check the vocabulary. So as I was saying, um, uh, we can go back to the presentation which has got uh, information about the particular sites. Uh, um, you can look at the Smart Street site to see uh, the, what the markup actually looks like. You can, even if in the UK to book up to your, bring your grandchildren or children to see Santa Claus. But uh, that's not the point. And, and here are all the, um, the there's the Green Turtle um, Chrome extension and then the structured data, tool, uh, structured data testing tools. Now, Let's move into extending schema.org. The schema.org um, data is all held on the web. So um, let me get back to my web browser. Let's close a, a few things off. Uh, and let's go to um, uh, GitHub. GitHub is the open repository that contains the schema.org source. It not only contains the source for the vocabulary itself, it contains the source for uh, the, the site and, uh, and all the Python scripts that run it. So most of the application are in these files at the bottom here. If we go and have a look in the data area, we have uh, uh, schema.rdfa, that's the main controlling file that contains the vocabulary, uh, and we have very examples files and then we go down into the extension area and you can see uh, the extensions for um, the auto extension, etc, etc. The best way um, to operate in this environment, you, you can work on GitHub if you want to, but the best way to uh, operate with this is actually to bring a copy down onto your local machine. So let me pull up a, um, a terminal window, let's clear all the rubbish away. Uh, so here we are in the terminal window uh, on my Mac um, machine here but there's any other command line tool that you can use. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm actually in an empty directory at the moment so what I'm going to do here is to have the schema, um, the, um, uh, the git command for making a cloned copy of the schema.org repository at its current state into my local directory. So this will take a few moments as it downloads all the objects uh, and expands them and creates the directory structure on my machine. Um, let's say it takes a few moments, as you can see, it's um, it's getting up around the 30 megabytes now, uh, and it has now done it. So if I do a listing, you can see I've now got a directory called schema.org, best viewed in, where's it gone? My finder application, where's it gone? Ah, here we are. So here we are in the webinar directory, which has now got a subdirectory of schema.org, and you, you're, you're seeing exactly the same directory structure that we would, um, we would see uh, in GitHub. So let's go and have a look at the vocabulary. So let's go and have a look in the data directory, and schema.org.rdfa is the, the file that contains the main vocabulary definition. If I open that with my favorite editor, let's get the size up a bit. You, you will see it looks very much like a HTML document with uh, loads of cryptic stuff in there. Um, uh, it's, it's like that deliberately because if you uh, open the file directly, uh, where uh, let's see if I can get into the, um, the correct directory on here, webinar, schema.org, data. So if, if I open the schema.org file here, 
using my web browser, it comes up looking very 1998 um, HTML. But it, it, it's showing you all the terms that, that are actually embedded using uh, the schema.org vocabulary. Um, so look, looking in here, we've got the definition for the thing, whoops, for thing. Uh, below it, we've got the definition for creative work, etc. Um, if, if I go and look at, uh, let, me, let me think of something. Uh, go and have a look for creator. Um, here we go. Uh, I've got the definition of the uh, creator property, which has in its range, um, in its domain, creative work and user comments, and it expects an organization or a person as its type. So let me, um, uh, if I can find the right key on my keyboard, come back up to the top. So imagine you wanted to create a new type uh, as a potential extension to the vocabulary. In the good tradition of the web, it's, it's a matter of um, copying and pasting what's there before. So here I'm going to take uh, the definition of creative work. I'm going to copy it uh, and let's give yourself a bit of space. I will paste it back in. Here we go. Uh, uh, let's imagine we're going to create a new type of my type. Um, uh, and it's going to have a label of my type. Uh, let's go, I don't know, what description? Uh, Richard's type. Why not? Uh, and, and it's a subclass of, of thing here. Um, and this this source description, if something's coming in from another vocabulary, uh, we, we reference where that's coming from as an acknowledgement, not as a, uh, a hard tie in um, in um, sort of ontology terms, but just a reference of where it came from. Well, I, I can remove that from this one. So now, if I go down, let's let's create a a property of our own. So I'll copy that. Um, Open that up again uh, and give myself a bit of space to drop it in. Let's create a uh, a new top uh, a new property of I don't know my prop. Uh, copy this um, and then we'll change the comment. Uh, my prop, we would say that its domain would be uh, my type. Um, um, and we'll, we'll only have it on, uh, on our new special property. And, and let's say it expects uh, a person. So I've now added that to the vocabulary. So I'm going to save my file. But that's really good. But um, how am I going to see it? I've just edited the file on my machine. Do I need to put it up to somewhere to see it or whatever? Well, I can actually see it locally. I can, um, I can um, use a, a version of the Google App Engine, which um, we can get from um, Google itself. So let me just. Uh, where are we? Here we go. Uh, if you go to the Google App Engine, uh, we we have the d the downloads here. Um, th this is say uh, I can download it for Python. Uh, I can download it for Java and so on. Um, Schema.org sites in Python. So if I download that onto my machine and follow the instructions, what it ca I I can do is run a local version of that on my machine. So whoops. Uh, if I if I go to the end now, right? So by running this simple command line command, I'm now running a local version of the application server that um, is used to run the main site. And on here, you can see it is running on my local host machine at port 8080. So if I go and have a look in my web browser uh, and set it up to uh, come into localhost at 8080. I, I'm now running a version of schema.org on my machine in my own little world. Uh, and if I uh, 
look for my type. Here we go. Here's, here's the type I've just defined with its own little property, my property. So you can work within the vocabulary very easily to define the, the, the types and properties that you would want to use in, in your environment. Um, so that's how it runs um, uh, locally. Now, if very often people work in a community around these kind of things, so it, it may be good for you to do it on your machine, but how, how, how is it going to operate on other machines? Um, so what you can do is run something called uh, a Google App Engine in the, um, uh, in the cloud, um, where what you can do is have free versions of Google App Engine running. So this is my developer's console. If you join Google, I won't go through the steps here, but if you join Google, um, um, you can have, um, with sign-ups, you can have free App Engines. Uh, and you end up with a console on here. The only thing I'd point out is you end up on this, this console page, and for the life of me, I ha never remember where to find to create a new app engine. It actually lives under this menu here, and it's got create a project. So you would create a project, and I've already created one here uh, with the title of SDO for schema.org-webinar. These are globally named. So if somebody else has already used your name, uh, you can't have an app engine of, of, of that sort. But you create an app engine, and then in the, your uh, web browser, let's, uh, in, in your local command line environment, um, you... Uh, um, where are we? Uh -huh. I can't find the command. Where's it gone? Uh, where are we? Clear. Here we go. So I, I've got the app config command here. So I'm running the app config to update the schema.org settings. So if I run that, what's happening is it's taking my version of the uh, schema.org app, and I haven't got permission at the moment. Why have I not got permission? Uh, that's probably because I run this webinar in a different user environment. But fortunately, I did. <laughs> did do this earlier, uh, expecting um, the odd wrinkle. So if I go to sdo-webinar.appspot.com, uh, so the SDO webinar is prefixed to the general appspot.com path. And if I go in there, I'm looking at the version of schema.org that I've got locally. Uh, and if I, if I put in my type, we can see Richard's new type and my property, etc. So this is the way you can share with colleagues that are working on the, on the, um, the, the same environment as you, the, um, um, the, the environment. Uh, and this is the way community groups work very well. You can have lots of discussions about how you're going to extend the, value, the, the vocabulary, but actually showing people in a live environment is exceedingly powerful. And this is how the main schema that all call uh, operates when people make proposals. That are part of the proposals, they put uh, updates in, in, in the Git environment, which are then compared on a, on a site like this. The final thing I'm going to look at um, in this particular area is um, the examples. So um, we have a file called examples.txt, which has got all the examples for, for the vocabulary. Uh, and you can see lots of them ending in examples.txt. In fact, what happens in these directories is the system looks for anything that ends in examples.txt. That's a pattern that uh, continued in the, uh, in the extension area. So we have an extension sub area of data with the auto and bib examples in here and, and, and the bib um, RDFA. So here I've got the RDFA uh, that defines the, uh, the bib extension, for instance. But I was, I was going to look at the, um, the, um, the examples text. So let me... Uh, Look at the example for audiobook. Let's open that with my favourite editor. Whoops. Open with my favourite editor. Here we go. So here what we're seeing is the standard format for examples file. So 
what this first line is doing is saying on the schema.org definition pages for audio book and read by I want these, this example to appear. Here's the pre markup, so this is the HTML uh, before it's modified. Here is the microdata section, so it's the same data but with schema.org embedded in it using microdata. As you can see, we've got the RDF up, uh, above. And finally, here's the um, JSON LD version of the same thing. And when you're proposing uh, additions to schema.org, it's good a practice to. Um, to uh, uh, apply examples with the data. Most of the discussion you find when people are looking at these extensions is how would you apply that, how would I use that, etc. So, um, so that we um, have got uh, some context when we're looking at, at this uh, after the webinar, here, here are some uh, useful links, not the useful links I was looking for at that time. So let's, uh, let's move forward. In, in here we go. Here's the useful links for what I've just been showing you for the last few minutes. So here's the schema.org Git repository. Uh, if you haven't got Git on your on, on your machine, uh, here is how you can get a command line version. There's also a graphical version. Uh, here's the clone command to get the latest version of, of, of Git onto your machine. Uh, there's the app engine download so you can run the whole site on your local machine. Uh, whoops. Why did we go forward? Um, and uh, here's the developers console where you can create your own app engine. And this is the webinar um, app spot instance, which I'll leave up and running for uh, a while after this webinar. So, um, in summary, schema.org, both in the previous webinar and this one, we've we've heard about how it was launched in 2011, uh, how it's grown from over 100 uh, types through um, 600 and nearly 650. It's now got 900 properties, 219 values. This is in the core, this is without the extensions. Uh, it's one of the significant sources of data for knowledge graphs. So if you want to get your data in the, the knowledge graphs being amassed by the search engines and others, this is the vocabulary to do it. Currently there are two extensions vid.schema.org and auto.schema.org, but I'm well aware of uh, medical extensions, health extensions, finance and banking extensions, all sorts of other extensions in, in, in process at the moment being defined and, and uh, being proposed. Uh, there's a flat, flat name space including the extensions. So as we saw, audiobook is in the bibschema.org extension but its URI is schema.org slash audiobook. Um, it's designed to be embedded in HTML using the microdata RDF A or JSON LD syntaxes, but it's not trapped in, in HTML. It's a perfectly good vocabulary for describing linked data in your own environment if it co covers the areas that you're looking at, or maybe with a minor localized extension it may handle that. But obviously its target audience is the web. There are several test tools and sites to help with links that I gave you earlier on. The source runs on the Google App Engine and it's held openly within GitHub and both the source and the vocabulary are, are our open source code. So if you wanted to make your own external version of schema.org to put your own particular extension vocabulary in, for instance, you can take the source code uh, and, and fork it for your own environment, which is in fact what I did when I set up the bibliograph.net site. Uh, you can extend and test locally, and you can share on a free development app engine at appspot.com. So you can share with your friends or use it as something to point at when you're having a discussion. Some, uh, some final uh, links to, um, to look at. There's obviously the schema.org site, there's the extensions, there's the community group that's run schema.org itself, uh, which is mainly used as a mailing list for com comments and discussion. There's the GitHub repository, uh, and much of the discussion happens in issues around particular items in there. There's Dan Scott's RDFA code lab, lab which I would heartily recommend for you to get your head around schema.org. Uh, the schema.org blog, which very often announces new issues or discusses particular points. And there's my personal blog, uh, the Data Liberate blog, and there are elements on there uh, around schema.org uh, 
uh, explaining features of, of, of special aspects of schema.org such as uh, the role feature uh, and, and, and other aspects. And, and that's kind of all I wanted to say today and I'm pleased that only one thing really went wrong and I got permission wrong. But never mind, that was, uh, uh, th that was a reasonable ride. So I can lean back and, and, and answer some questions now. Thank you, Richard. And uh, questions are open. We have a couple coming in. Um, and the, let me give you the first one, uh, Richard, and then maybe add some gloss to the question. The first <laughs> question is, are there plans to add a family class? Now, the gloss I want to add on this is, is there some place where you ask for something new and it sort of happens from other people doing something? Yes, yes, you're, you're leading to me, me towards the answer, is if you believe there is a need for something in schema.org, whether it's a, uh, a minor tweak to a description of a property in the core or a, a whole new type, etc., uh, the, 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 the place to have that discussion, well, there are two places. There's the schema.org mailing list, which is in the schema.org, uh, schema.org W3C community group, or you can have discussion by raising an issue uh, on the GitHub repository. And what that community would be looking for is justification for um, such a type. Um, you know, I, 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 I type for family. Uh, I can see some relevance for. Um, we have family names. Um, but in, you would make the suggestion, probably put some examples together of how you would uh, put together real data, uh, identifying a real site, especially if it's one that you manage and you, you can look at how you would promote that kind of thing, but some examples and, and suggest that to, to the group. And it's a very active group, it's a very open group, uh, and usually you'll get some, some form of feedback, and if it's picked up by the organisation and people believe it will be used uh, by uh, sufficient um, people across the web if it was available, uh, it stands a very good chance of getting into a, a later version of schema.org, but it's totally community driven. So those are the places that you would make such a suggestion. And, and it, it isn't an autonomous body for you to say, are there plans to put a family type in there? Uh, it, I, I'm not aware of any proposals for a family type. I may be wrong, there's uh, several hundreds of uh, uh, proposals I've seen over the months and years, so I can't guarantee I haven't seen one for family. But if you if you think it's relevant, uh, please propose it. Uh, can I uh, just a fast one uh, from me? Couldn't Sean, who asked this question, simply do the GitHub trick and propose one? Yes. Actually, submit one. Actually, yes, yes. on the yes. desktop, make the change, submit it back in for consideration. Correct. Correct. Um, and um, some people do that. Sometimes you want to test the water with the community and put in an issue that says, uh, I think we ought to have a family type, does everybody else agree? And a discussion will flow. And then very often as part of the discussion, uh, John could at that time knit his own, as you put it, uh, with some examples and submit that to the GitHub, commit it and create a pull request for it. Uh, and then if, if the community agrees that's a good idea, uh, that pull request um, can, can then be uh, agreed by, if you like, the, the, the core team around schema.org uh, who say what's going in the next release and, and if that pull request is accepted, it will get into the, to the next version of the vocabulary and that's using GitHub for what it was designed for. Thank you. Um, a question from Mary. Where is the best place to learn about what extensions are in progress? <laughs> um, um, I, th I wish I knew <laughs> is the answer to that question from my point of view. Uh, I keep tripping over people talking about developing new extensions. Invariably what you will find is there will be communities that will consider creating extensions themselves. Uh, and, and may well test the water by uh, posting something on the um, 
uh, on the schema.org mailing list or occasionally somebody will drop me a line and say I'm thinking of doing this type of extension but it's, it's, it's just in the community uh, but in the community there's initiatives to extend the core, make additions to the core as well as straight um, extensions. I, I've recently been involved with a group where we were looking to create a specific extension for schema.org and then when we looked at most of the the types and properties uh, that we were looking to define, we believed actually they are very good candidates to enhance the core vocabulary and could be generally useful uh, in an area much wider than the particular domain that we're worrying about. Uh, and and the, the idea came through that, well, let's make a small proposal to add value to the core with a couple of extra types, uh, maybe five or six and, um, you know, 10 or so properties to add value to the core, but also then that becomes the foundation for a more detailed domain specific extension that we're looking to uh, to add further on down the line. So you, you, can, you can approach both. All I would say to anybody looking trying to create an extension is if you present the group with a massive extension with 25, 30, 50 new types and 100 new properties, uh, the, the group will probably get indigestion and you will probably wouldn't get much traction from people reviewing it. Remember people are committing a lot of their time out of uh, enthusiasm for the whole project here. So the best approach is to test the water, uh, make small proposals with a handful of types and a, a handful of properties that's well defined with lots of examples and you can drop it into the system and hope it gets adopted and then follow it on and, and, and build from that point of view. Uh, uh, the, we, we have a, an objective in the, in the community of regularly re releasing uh, versions. Uh, I'm sure uh, I, I could uh, channel Dan Brickley who works for Google but is the if you like, in charge of the day-to-day uh, -day management of the schema.org site, when he, he's, he would like to get a release a month out. I think, I think we kind of get uh, one every two to three months out, but that's a fairly rapid process. So uh, don't be disheartened by going for a small self-contained um, proposal um, to the vocabulary and then build up upon it later if it gains traction, acceptance, and then usage. If your proposals are being used widely across the web, that's a great case for you to extend things even further. Thank you. A question from Sharon. Are there crosswalks available for the three syntax options if you build in one and later move to another? I'm assuming this is the RDFA. Uh, uh, yeah, microdata. RDFA, microdata, JSON, LD. Uh, yes, there are. There are tools that are doing uh, that do it. The uh, the um, structured data linter um, is one of the tools that, we, uh, that will take in data in one format and output in another. Um, the, the only thing I would say is what they do is they will read the data in as, as a form of RDF um, from microdata or RDFA or, or um, JSON-LD and treat it as a graph. So it will treat it as a graph of, um, of entities with relationships. So when it outputs in another format, it then reads back out from that graph. There tends not to be too much structural difference when you're going between microdata and RDFA because they're so similar. But when you get into JSON-LD, everything's there, but at first look, it seems to be in a very strange order. Uh, and when you're using that to create uh, examples, sometimes you have to do some man manual editing. But the tools are there to do it. And if you're developing a website and you want to do this kind of tool, thing, those tools are based on open source um, uh, vocabularies uh, and open source code. Uh, something called RDF lib is used in Python in one or two other languages, which is the, um, the low level constructs that are used to create these tools. A question from Diane. Can you use the structured data testing tools with other vocabularies than schema.org? Some of them you can, some of them you can't. Um, uh, structured data linter is quite good at looking at all sorts of other vocabularies. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, the, the Google testing tool and the Yandex testing tool um, 
pick up things from other vocabularies, uh, they may not um, share them uh, with you, if you know what I mean. RDFA play, I've got a feeling that will work with other vocabularies as well. Sometimes you have to kind of def define the, the vocabulary, so faux or um, uh, or um, Dublin Core or, or some of the other vocabularies that, that work in this environment. There are tools that will work generically with, with, with these environments uh, and they all came from a generic environment, uh, things like the Structured Data Linter and the RDFA Play. Uh, they, they didn't start off as being schema specific. A question from Hannah. How do you keep data separate or together for two records that refer to the same person or thing? For example, how are uh, Mark Twain and Samuel Clemens' records connected? Well, um, that depends on the owner of the data. How you would describe that within um, uh, schema.org, so if you had a data set or a database that described uh, two people, um, what you, you could do very simply in the schema.org markup would use the same as property which comes in from the thing type so you, you can say that Samuel Clements same as uh, an, another description um, of, of Mark Twain. Uh, it's the same technique that you, you would use that if on your site you were describing uh, Mark Twain uh, from your data set and you wanted to point to the uh, wiki data representation of, of, the, of, the, of Mark Twain as well, where you'd use the same as property and drop in the, uh, the URL, the URI for the wiki data reference. So the question partially is what's your, uh, the answer is depends on what your data set looks like, how you share it uh, internally, how you manage the data behind your website. Uh, the tools within schema.org uh, allow you to um, pr provide um, the markup that the ex outside world would understand. Okay, maybe one more question and then I think we're going to have to call time. Um, are there thoughts about trying to structure all of the discussions in RDF so the community can search and browse through all previous insights on schema.org classes and properties? <laughs> Right. Well, there, there is a, there's some uh, very simple efforts in that direction. Uh, and if I just quickly, uh, I don't know whether you can still see my screen. You probably can. If yes. you look at if you look at uh, a schema.org page, I've got my type up here, which won't be relevant. But if you uh, if you open the more button at the top of the page, uh, you can leave public feedback on that term, which will uh, uh, provide data in, in, into the schema.org environment for you to look. The important one here is to check for open issues, and that does a very simple uh, search into um, the GitHub repository for open issues that, that reference um, uh, my, uh, the particular type that you're looking at. Um, as to using RDFA to do that, I have heard this mentioned and it's a great project for somebody. Um, but I, I think most people in the organization around schema.org, extending it and enhancing it, are, are, are kind of seeing that uh, as more important. If somebody listening would like to do that, I'm sure people would, would love to uh, see the results. Thank you, Richard. Um, there are still some questions in the queue, and uh, Richard will have access to those questions and after the webinar is over and can address them. So, Richard, I'd like to thank you for today's webinar uh, and observe, make one observation. Um, people like me who work with bodies that do either quasi or ad hoc standardization, all of the standardization bodies are watching schema.org because it inverts or seems to invert um, the processes that are normally in place in developing developing standards. In other words, it isn't top-down, it's community up. And the utilization of mechanisms to allow, a, to allow anyone, in a way, to, to suggest and to build from the bottom up. Uh, so in that sense, it's very, very different and uh, hopefully a successful experiment but I, in closing, would 
do you make observations on this distinction between the traditional ISO, even Dublin Core, DCMI, ISO, NISO um, uh, standardization processes, and this one, which is so different? Um, um, the, the word that comes to mind is refreshing and agile. So that's two words. Uh, uh, it, it, it seems to be an approach that sits in the kind of world we, we are moving into where the, the web and the things around it, if anything, are moving too fast for the traditional processes and very often the traditional process will deliver a standard at the end of it that either people find doesn't work when they apply it or would have been better if they could have tweaked something halfway through its development. I'm not saying that uh, the community up approach is perfect. Uh, there are various areas within schema.org that have had to have been revisited and sometimes when you look at some of the early um, definitions and relationships you kind of go, oh I wish we hadn't have done it that way. Uh, so th there, are, there, there are upsides and downsides but I, th I think schema.org is, is demonstrating the su success of a collaborative environment that can move and react rapidly to the tra changing world around us. Okay, thank you, Richard. I think we're at the end. Um, I'd like to thank everybody, all of the participants. Um, there were many registered and um, over a, nearly 200 that showed up in person today. Uh, I want to thank you for coming. And again, Richard, thank you very much for, for this series, for the two webinars uh, around this very interesting thing called schema.org. So thank you thank very you. much. Good day. To those still on the webinar, the recording of today's webinar and presentation of the slides will be made available within 48 hours of today's presentation. And that is all. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.